This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Gary Smith. Well, happy Sunday, Gary. Welcome to the Altar of Bard uh, for our Sunday edition, which is becoming our uh, main edition as of late. Uh, There's so much going on during the week uh, that it's hard. We're hard pressed. Um, and maybe we ought to start reinvigorating the midweeks because uh, otherwise we've got too much to fill on Sunday. I've been watching, as you know, this impeachment trial of, of the Texas attorney general. And boy, if you're a lawyer or you appreciate courtroom action, that what a masterclass in lawyering it is. Uh, we've got a couple of clips for that. Gary, you want to I don't know which one I want to start with. It's like an embarrassment of riches, maybe with the Ranger, because you have that uh, handy where is it? It's uh, I think Cogdell, um, who's and by the way, so that I set this up, the attorney general is being impeached by actually a house that's controlled by the Republicans and the uh, they have hired basically outside counsel. They've got Rusty Harden and Dick DeGaron, two of the legendary uh, uh, old dogs. And I say that uh, as an old dog of uh, Texas uh, uh, trial lawyers uh, for the House managers. And on the defense side is an up and comer, Tony Busby and Cogdell, who some of you may recognize when you see him. Uh, has gained a measure of fame, besides being a great lawyer, a measure of fame because there is now a series on Waco, and he had tried that case, I think, back in 93 and got acquittals, and um, that set him on the course uh, for a uh, splendid career. So why don't we start with the Ranger? I think this is Cogdale. The witness is a Ranger. Yeah, his name is David Maxwell. And in the opening statements, they had let – They had kind of teased what this was going to look like. Let's try. Let's try again. What's the answer to my question, Ranger? Which is the third time since you don't qualify your explanations and explain to us whether they are based on first person knowledge or you heard it from somebody else. How do we know what you are basing your explanations on my explanations of what now what are you referring to when you say what did I base my explanations on my objection was asked and answered actually he hasn't answered overruled by the way for those of you who are watching YouTube that uh, at council table there was on the left was Rusty Harden on the right who was speaking was Dick DeGaron. You may recognize Dick DeGaron, who's um, had a also a, a spectacular career. Most recently tried the case with the uh, gentleman who was the subject of um, a murder prosecution here in L.A., um, who was convicted yet died right after sentencing. Dick got him acquitted in Texas, um, and he was the uh, heir to a uh, real estate fortune. Name was uh, Durst. And Rusty has represented a who's who of Texas notables, uh, including um Roger Clemens and was involved in the uh, the Enron case. Interestingly, this so to set the scene for this ranger, the ranger had told the investigators that the, the pack, one of Paxson's uh, minions had met in a dark alley with somebody to drop off stuff. I mean, uh, uh, just a tale of in the middle uh, of the night. Itch. Yeah, right. In the middle of the night. Well, it turns out he didn't see this. And it turns out that there he claims four or five people told him this. He doesn't remember who they are. And but he doesn't say that. Though. He doesn't explain that in his declaration. He leads yeah. he leaves it open to be interpreted as though he witnessed this himself. Exactly. So go on and you'll see Kondo drill him like a dentist. So that you and I are clear, Ranger. Okay. You are a fellow that's taught folks how to testify, right? I'm um, saying that. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it that every time I ask you if you've taught folks to testify, you suddenly can't hear the question? 
Actually, my testifying, I learned by experience. Okay. And is that one of the things you've learned by experience, Ranger, to pause and act like you haven't heard the question? Maybe. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, what did you learn? I learned that it throws you off. Does it? Does it? Okay. And that's your intent? Ranger, rather than testifying to the truth and giving direct answers, your game is to throw people off. Is that where we're going, Ranger? Is that where we're going? No. That's what you just said. That's what you just suggested. I just said that I do sometimes pause. It's just something. I And there's another one, Gary. With another lawyer, do you have that another defense lawyer? The uh, the one with uh, Anthony also. Yeah, let's see that. And, uh, when you call it up, I'll tell you. I'll set that scene as well. Yeah, it's right here. Yes, um, this is pretty good. There's also another clip. We'll get to it in a second that I want to set up. But this is pretty good. Let's uh, let's watch this. Yeah, this is uh, Anthony Osso from the defense uh, interviewing, uh, examining uh, Ryan Bangert, who was uh, worked in the AG's office. Uh, let's see here. Do you not remember that? Sir, we did not go behind the attorney general's back. Did you tell him you were going to the FBI? Yes or no? Sir, we did yes not go no, behind the... Mr. Bangert, I'm asking you yes or no questions. Did you tell Ken Paxton you were going to the FBI? Yes or no? I cannot answer that question with a yes or Witness, no. She'll answer the question. Yes or no, Mr. Bangert. By the way, that was the preside. There is somebody who's presiding over this. You would call it a judge. He's not a judge, although I think Togdell has uh, done what I do frequently, where you call somebody who's not a judge a judge. Yeah. Uh, that is the person overruling. And clearly, this witness is not answering. I believe it's the, the uh, lieutenant governor, right? I'll tell you in a sec. But let's... And with ample opportunity. That's not what I asked you. Did you tell Ken Paxton you were going to the FBI? Yes or no? We gave him ample opportunity. That's not what I asked. Objection, non-responsive, Your Honor. I'd ask that he answer the question before him. Witness is ordered to answer the question, yes or no. Mr. Bangard, it's a very simple question. Did you tell Ken Paxton that you were going to go to the FBI? On September 30th, it's we did yes not. It's a yes or no question, Mr. Bangert. It it's is a not yes or no. a yes or no It is question. a yes or no question, Excuse counsel. Me. Excuse me, sir. Your Honor, he said, he answered the question, but because he was talking on top of him, he didn't hear it. He said, on September the 30th, we did not. And he starts interrupting him halfway before, and the court reporter probably had trouble hearing. We did not. So I just asked him to let him finish what he's saying and not talk on top of him, if for no other person than the court reporter. You can ask the question one more time. Mr. Bangert, it is a yes or no question, and I want a yes or no answer. Did you tell Ken Paxton that you were going to the FBI? I did not tell Ken Paxton before I went to the FBI. Okay. That was that was uh, that was a way to handle it, uh, and for those who are uh, want to know how to cross examine, just be relentless in getting your answer, and don't let the witness control you. Control the witness, and this is obviously a witness who uh, does not want to answer the question. If you had a jury, a jury would get pretty uh, uh, get the idea pretty quickly. There's another one where the first assistant is being cross examined who had taken the Ken Paxton's name off the stationery. Do you have that, Gary? Uh, I have one with the first assistant. Let's uh, let's play that. I'm not positive if it's the exact one you're thinking of, but let's check this out. Yeah, this is, this is Tony Busby. Tony is, um, uh, some people may recognize the name. I believe he represented many of the uh, massage so-called therapists who were involved in the Houston uh, quarterback uh, who's now with Cleveland, right, Gary? Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson. Um, and he was all over Deshaun in the civil matter. And here he is 
uh, cross-examining the first assistant to Ken Paxton, which is also, in my opinion, a masterful cross. And this is six months. I mean, come on. Six months after you left the office, six months after you'd went to the FBI. This is this is after some of the some of your colleagues had filed a very public lawsuit. Right. Correct. And this is even after that you had been interviewed in the press. Right. I believe one time. Yes. Yeah. And all kinds of things were going on in the press about these so-called whistleblowers and and crimes and all kinds of things. And then here you are placed under oath in March of 2021. And you were asked point blank whether you believed the office of the AG was engaged, had been engaged in ongoing criminal activity in relation to Nate Paul. And you couldn't even give an answer. Could you? With regard to the office of attorney general, correct. You're making some distinction between the office and the AG himself? Yes, sir. Okay. Because you didn't want to say that you had been engaged in criminal activity, right? I don't believe... No. I mean, part of the so-called criminal activity is the MIDI intervention, isn't it? And you were dead in the middle of that, weren't you? I approved the executive memorandum. Isn't it ironic that the first witness called in this case for the House on the first article of impeachment that was passed, that this witness, you approved that intervention. Isn't that ironic? Uh, I, I don't know, sir. Don't you think that really reflect, kind of reflects the whole House's case? That they put you up here as the witness to tell us how bad Ken Paxton was, and on the very first article, you approved it. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? The, the irony, I guess, is lost on me, sir. Is it? It is. <laughs> You have to admit, Gary, that's a pretty good little uh, setup, if you will, because he was the first witness. He is the first assistant on the first article of impeachment. He approved it. It gets better. I mean, yeah, they. I think that's the uh, the end of that edit. There was there were so many that guy got caught a few different times. Uh, it was like I say, it, it was a great cross examination. Kudos to Busby for that. Uh, he he came prepared for bear and he he uh, ended up uh, putting this little bear cub down. Um, now. I think there was one other. Did you have one other clip, Gary? We have two other clips uh, that are both different. There's one from Cogdell and one from Busby, and they're from their openings. The Cogdell one is just sort of a a 51-second clip of his opening, and then I have a compilation of Busby's opening as well. Yeah, why don't we why don't we do the Cogdell and then we're going to hit on a couple other subjects. So you understand, this has been played on C-SPAN. For those of us who don't have a hobby, it's uh, extremely entertaining. Yeah, there's a the, the, there is just so much and so much video out of this. The fact that it's all being presented and live streamed, it's just an embarrassment of riches. There's there's we could sit here for three hours. And by the way, this. next week, in uh, in uh, fairness to Dick DeGarren and uh, and Rusty, we'll have some clips of them as well. Yes, absolutely. Here we go. The direction he gave Mark Penley, who worked for him, was exactly the same direction he gave Brandon Kamek. Find the truth. We're going to impeach a sitting attorney general for giving the direction, find the truth. Not one person, not one piece of evidence will you hear where they say lie, where Ken Paxton told him to lie, cheat, steal, shade, do whatever it takes. I just, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And yet here we sit with 31 of you, with 15 of us and 15 or more of them, here we sit when the allegation, when the, when the allegation is it's corrupt, when the, when the truth is, he said, go find the truth for God's sakes. Just love it. I, uh, fantastic. You know, the, if that was in a courtroom, the uh, the opposing counsel would be uh, having an aneurysm uh, over that. That is transgressed into argument. But as my father used to say, the the hallmark of a good trial lawyer is you can commit error and know you're doing it at the the, the same time. And um, that was uh, passionate and uh, and it was a good theme and it had that repetition that you want and and I think probably uh, set the tone for. 
witness after witness so far who's been dismantled by the defense in this case. Yeah, and that was just a short clip in the opening. The, the opening lasted about an hour, and each uh, each of Cogdale and Busby both got about 30 minutes, and they were both very compelling, in my opinion. So we've got. So I encourage people to watch it. We'll give you an update, maybe even a midweek. There's been quite a bit else that's going on in the legal world, and uh, we want to hit some of those, not the least of which Danny Masterson, which um, – uh, in full disclosure, Philip Cohen, who tried that case, is a friend I consider a, a good friend. And Masterson was sentenced the uh, day before yesterday, I believe, to 30 years. Yeah. You, know, some of you might remember the first trial ended in a hung jury. Hung tilting. jury tilting towards him on all three counts, right? He was, you right. know, it was right. as much as 10 to in some cases and then uh, less in other other charges. Yeah, and then guess what happened? A uh, story often told. Uh, the uh, the the court changed many of her rulings uh, before or during the second trial, uh, which basically ensured a guilty verdict. Uh, and interestingly, also um, the Ashton Kusher you may have seen, yeah. And- um, Mila Kunis and a bunch of the other different castmates all wrote letters, you know, urging leniency. Right. And then had to walk it back because they got so much grief from the cheap seats and which tells you all you need to know about the state of uh, the criminal law and criminal jurisprudence that here's somebody that, you know, that you've worked with and you're coming to his support. And all of a sudden they're pilloried for that. And yeah. uh, I, uh, I. Uh, just uh, something to say. It'll be interesting to see where they get an appeal. So it's always tough because the courts, the appellate courts, uh, oftentimes don't want to um, uh, kind of invade or say that there was an abuse of discretion. In this case, you did, however, have a dry run under one set of rulings and then um Boy, you get a completely different result when you change those rulings, which shows you the the role that a trial judge has in a criminal case. Sure sounds a lot like another case that uh, you might have some involvement in perhaps from back in the 90s that uh, that yeah. rings a bell. Yes, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it, uh, it resonates. So what um, you, just, can I ask real fast, you know, obviously they had some time since the conviction and I heard it reported that they've had appellate lawyers on that in the interim. So where do you think that they stand, you know, in terms of readiness to, to go forward with an appeal? I think that they'll be ready. I think they've had, there was a significant period of time since he was remanded in the custody after the verdict and the sentencing. They've ordered, I'm sure, daily transcripts. So they've got all the transcripts, at least in rough form. They will wait for the final transcripts, then the clerk's record on appeal. They'll file it in the, uh, that'll be filed in the court of appeal. They got a briefing schedule uh, almost uh, immediately. If they haven't already filed a notice of appeal, they will sometime in the next next uh, not so distant future and in, in no case later um, than the statutory requirement, then the Court of Appeal will issue its orders and the briefing schedule. I wouldn't imagine that they want at this point um, uh, more than one continuance, depending on what the record looks like and maybe augmenting the record. But they also probably will attempt at least to interview the jurors and see what the what that has to do. So that's the other kind of looming factor here. Speaking of which. Yeah, absolutely. Great segue. The jurors, the, it's a good segue into the Murdoch case. I we this has been stunning, to say the least. Those who uh, remember Murdoch as a lawyer who was charged with and uh, with a numerous counts of embezzlement from the clients, also with murdering his wife and son. Uh, he took the stand in his own defense, and to a much uh, most everyone's surprise during that trial, because it appeared to be a highly or almost exclusively circumstantial evidence case, and the jury came back in record time. Three hours, uh, I believe, after right. a and, three-week trial. And the judge sentenced him, and he's been, you know, shaved his head, got his uh, prison mugshot sent off. Well, uh, Dick Carpootlian and Jim Griffin filed this week a motion, um, uh, and in it, they had declarations from not one, but two of the jurors who said the clerk of the court 
We have a picture of the clerk of the court. Gary. I can pull one up. Absolutely. Yeah, the clerk of the court before Murdoch took the stand. And mind you, for those who have watched, I've told you many times that that's the toughest decision you ever have to make as a defense lawyer, because all the jury's going to talk about after you put your client on the stand in a criminal case is what did the defendant say? That's the that's the whole ball game. Everything that the prosecution has presented kind of goes out the window, and the jury jury focuses on the defendant's testimony. Here is the picture of the clerk, and there Rebecca is, Hill. Yeah, and Berta. Well, it turns out if you accept what the jurors said, that she went in and told the jurors. Don't believe anything he said. Focus on him. Watch his body language. Yeah, watch the body language. And um, an extraneous, completely improper communication with the jurors, which was not reported, number one. And number two, what gives this even more legs is apparently she was writing a book. She wrote it. It's it's out. Yeah, she yeah. co-wrote it. It's out. And they're using things that she said in the book, coupled with these new witness testimony or these new witness statements, uh, sorry, juror statements to, uh, to to bring this cause and demand a new trial. And I've seen plenty of link legal pundits saying that they're likely to get it. Well, I'll tell you, it'll be interesting to see who. The, and by the way, this is an elected clerk. Right. Which surprised me. I mean, we don't, we have elected city or county clerks and and city clerks in various jurisdictions, but this was the courtroom clerk who's apparently an elected, uh, it was an elected position. And if this is true, number one, who is going to preside over a hearing on this? Certainly it cannot be the judge who presided over the case. He's got to recuse himself. Yeah. And for all of the uh, people who were cheering on a conviction in this case, uh, I wonder now if you have some pause as to what actually transpired, because if this is true, it's stunning. She also reportedly encouraged them to come back with a quick verdict by explaining to them that if they didn't finish the verdict by the end of the day, they were going to have to go to hotels, which was not something that they had had to do during the trial. So it, it seemed like she was really kind of pushing them to to come back quickly. And, you know, obviously that. It Did I lie. also see that the, the smokers were not allowed to smoke? Correct. They- the smokers were not allowed to have smoke breaks, which uh, it, which she apparently explicitly outlined. It was uh, it just seemed like there was pressure there to uh, have the, the jury come back quickly. And, you know, I, one could one could figure out the implication there of what uh, what verdict they were looking for. You know, I've I've said for years, my, my biggest fear in cases are stealth jurors. God forbid that now we've got stealth court staff uh, who are uh, trying to engineer stuff. I mean, just frightening. Jewelry is having a big moment right now. And with hundreds of products popping up in your feed every day, it can be hard to find a brand you trust. Alex and Ani has been creating meaningful jewelry for over 20 years, designing pieces that connect you with all of life's important moments. With an emphasis on value, there's truly something for everyone. You might be most familiar with their signature charm bangle. This bracelet literally created the category of meaningful jewelry and had you stacking charms from your wrist to your elbow. This piece is an icon for a reason. Completely size inclusive, each bracelet is adorned with a symbol designed to tell your story and express your unique style. Beyond the bangle, you'll find stylish, affordable jewelry for every occasion, from classic pieces to bold statement looks. Don't know where to start? Alex and Ani makes it easy to unpack the trends you're after and spring in your personality too. Each piece comes with a personalized message and meaning, truly making it the perfect gift. You can take comfort in knowing that you're shopping with a socially conscious brand as well. To date, Alex and Ani has donated over $60 million to nonprofits worldwide, connecting fashion and philanthropy in an easy, fun, affordable way. Visit alexandani.com right now to discover the confidence that comes with a perfectly accessorized piece of jewelry. Right now, Alex and Ani is offering our audience 20% off with code Mike at checkout. Again, head to alexandani.com. That's A-L-E-X-A-N-D-A-N-I.com and use code Midas at checkout for 20% off your order. I guess we'll end on the fifth circuit, which is, this is a, the state of Missouri versus Biden. This is an amazing opinion for those who uh, watch or listen regularly, you'll remember that the district court in Louisiana had issued an order talking about the abridgment of free speech. 
and it went up to the Fifth Circuit. The district court had issued an injunction uh, against a, a number of people. Uh, the, this court of appeals opinion, if you, I, I invite you to read it. It is stunning. And you'll notice also one of the plaintiffs is a guy that we've talked about. Jay Bodasaria. Uh, yeah, Jay Bonifario, who, who uh, we used as an expert witness in a number of our cases here in California. And it became clear when you read the facts, the factual summation here, some of the, the FBI was involved, the CDC was involved, the White House was involved, all in trying to uh, put their fingers on the scale and actually, um, uh, in many cases, uh, basically threatening social media platforms uh, uh, into uh, censoring people. It's a, yeah. it's, it's really quite a decision into silencing and, speech. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to, you know, it's uh, I invite you to read it because the factual recitation is damning. And while they vacated much of, or not much, but large swaths of the, uh, district court injunction. What was left is certainly is certainly still frightening in America uh, in 2023 to see what's happened in the last three years. And by the way, Facebook uh, comes away. I don't know who looks worse in this, Facebook or the FBI, but uh, they're neck and neck in terms of who was uh, who was uh, worse. I mean, I, Facebook I think looks worse, but it, I would say that for me. It, the FBI comes away scarier because, you know, Facebook is a private corporation that I would intend. I would not expect to have the best interests of citizens necessarily at heart, whereas the FBI are supposed to be public servants. Well, they were they were serving the, their public. I'll tell you I, that. That's, Read the, like I say, it's a, I forget how many pages. Seventy four. Yeah, I was going to say 74. Uh, and it is it's worth if for nothing else, read the factual recitation, which, which is the first uh, one quarter of this opinion. It's stunning. Uh, it's frightening. And uh, I, by the way, if they if anybody thinks that taking this to by the way, this is the intermediate court. It was at the district court federally. This is the court of appeals, the circuit court, the only um, the two angles that they have now is to ask for an in-bank, the whole court, to review this or go to the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't think that they're going to get relief in either place. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, certainly compelling. And as a as a citizen, it's informative. So I would encourage everyone to check it out as well. Mark, thank you so much for your time on this beautiful Sunday. Thank you, Gary. This was an interesting uh, bard today, and uh, we'll revisit many of these things in the coming weeks. I look forward to it. Go enjoy the first uh, NFL Sunday of the year. It's a glorious day. Well, your charges are playing today at home, aren't yes, they? Yes, they are against Miami, who's missing one of their key players. So I have the uh, modicum the of hope, for, the modicum hope of hope that will uh, will uh, and you know inevitably be dashed before the day is out. Love it. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Mark. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash reasonable doubt podcast.